So anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, it's good to be back. And uh, Pastor Al, I, as was mentioned, is ministering there in Victorville. And that's a thriving church. It's growing as Pastor Alex and his wife. And uh, we thank God for them as well. Amen. Uh, unfortunately, my wife was not able to come with me uh, this particular trip. Uh, she's, uh, uh, she's recuperating. Amen. Man, they work those women over there in that conference. Amen. And don't go give them ideas about workshops. We don't, men don't like workshops. Amen. So stop, kill that idea. Amen. I mean, they had church in the morning, in the afternoon, right? Then in the evening. Okay, ladies, you got to keep quiet about that. If they announce workshops, I'm going to know it's you too. Because, uh, you know, telegraph, telegram, tell a woman, and they sword, spreads. My wife was literally wiped out yesterday. I literally just wiped. She got home by Friday at 1 o'clock in the morning. And uh, Saturday, she just spent the whole day just uh, relaxing and recuperating. Amen. And um, <clears throat> But anyway, praise the Lord. I understand it was a powerful conference. I got a chance to watch just a little bit online. And um, I understand it was real, real powerful. Amen? Amen. But now the mighty men of valor is right around the corner. Amen. Amen. And then the gang conference. Really? Really? You're looking at young in the rearview mirror. Come on, guys. It's for our young people. Amen. And uh, anyway, uh, praise God. This morning, let's get right to it because I know we have another service following. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. Uh, my grandson did come back with me and uh, uh, we turned him loose last Sunday night. And he preached a little bit and uh, we got all kinds of reports about that. Praise the Lord. And so he came with me uh, here this morning. But I want just I want us to go into the Word of God and begin with uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. And the scripture says in Proverbs 3, 27, Proverbs 3, 27, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it's in the power of your hand to do so. And what that simply means is this. If I can put it in, paraphrase it into a principle. And here it comes. Release that which you can see, and he'll release that which you cannot. Now, the opposite of that is hold back. And that's what that scripture is referring to. Do not withhold, right? Hold back that which you can see, and he'll hold back the miracle. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about releasing the miracle within your life. Releasing the blessing that God has for you. I really believe this, that God wants to bless each and every one of us. Now, what I'm going to speak to you about this morning is something that I have lived. In the over 45 years that I've been preaching the gospel, uh, I've lived this. I've experienced this. This isn't something I read out of a book or heard from another preacher, or got it on television, off a TV preacher. This is something that I've experienced in my own walk with God and in my ministry. Many of you have experienced it as well. I really believe with all my heart that God wants to bless us. Amen. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. As you look for that scripture, however, human nature is a factor, right? Human nature is a factor. And here's where human nature kicks in. When we have an abundance of something, we have a tendency to be very generous, right? You have a lot of gasoline in your car, you don't mind giving somebody a ride, right? Those of you who used to smoke, right? You smokers, somebody used to bum a cigarette off you. If you had a full pack of cigarettes, you gave them a cigarette. Hey, can I get a smoke? Here you go, buddy, right? Those of you that were bar hoppers and bar drinkers, nightclub, Right? If you had a pocket full of cash, right? You'd, you, got, you felt a little good, you felt a little tipsy, you were buying drinks for your buddies. Those of you who used to use drugs, which is pretty much most of you, when we were holding heavy, we'd turn our homies on. Hey man, show me some love, no problem. But when you're down to just a little bit, Right? Can you give me a right? You got gas money. <laughs> hey, man, let me a cigarette. No, it's my last one. I'm sorry. 
Come on, man, turn me on. <laughs> this is my wake up. I need this for tomorrow morning. We have a tendency when we're down to a little bit to what? Hold back. And the word of God is challenging us that when you go through a dry season, and I mean financially, when you go through a dry financial, and we've all been there, we're all going to go there eventually, right? Don't hold back. Because we give when we got a lot. But when we're going through a bit of a dry season and we all go through those things, we have a tendency to cut back. Now, I'm not saying don't be a good steward. And obviously, when you're going through a dry season, you want to manage your budget a little bit better. But don't budget out God. Your faith must always be bigger than your budget. Now, I believe really God wants to bless us. Ephesians 3.20 tells us that God is able. How many know God is able? Now, unto him who is able, God's able to save us. God's able to heal us. God's able to deliver us, right? The Bible says that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly. That's what my translation says. I'm working on a new King James Version because I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm not an international version, amen? Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, watch this, above all that we ask. In other words, the Word of God tells us and instructs us that God is able to bless us and even bless us for things that we didn't even ask for. And he even gives us more. Oh, my God. And watch this. He, he even gives us more than what we can imagine. When I got out of the men's home 75 years ago, When I got out of the men's home, yes, okay, we know you're there. You're a captive audience, amen. Uh, I went up to Northern California. I was in Oakland, California, in a Spanish Assembly of God church. Uh, we used to have a minister in our ministry called Sam Sanchez. And he was, uh, on the, so he was on one of the associate ministers there at a mother church. And uh, um, he was also a teacher of the and he, okay, he passed away. Well, this was his dad's church. That's how long ago it was. And I was in, I, I didn't go up there to preach. I was part of a team. Anyway, long story short, I hit the altar. And I asked God for something. I didn't ask God for a pretty wife, even though I got one anyway. I didn't ask God for a car. Eventually I got one. I didn't ask God for the money to go to Bible school, because God blessed me with that. Right? All those things I didn't ask for, but God gave them to me anyway. What I did ask God for, watch this, is I said, God, I just want to preach your word. Wait, 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 wait let me finish. I had no idea. I didn't even imagine at that time that I would be preaching all over the world. See, God is able to bless you and give you more than what you asked for, even more than what you can imagine. Ah, wait, 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 wait. Look at the latter part of that verse. Uh, according to the power that worked. You took the verse off. <laughs> right when I hit the punchline, you took it off. According to the power that works in us. See, everybody misses that part. There it is. Accor now, what kind of power are we talking about? We're talking about the power of faith and commitment. Okay, so here's our question this morning. What kind of faith and commitment do you and I need to exercise in order to experience the blessings of God? Well, the answer is found in John chapter 6, our final scripture. John chapter 6 records one of our Lord's most famous and popular miracles. We call it the feeding of the 5,000. But I'm going to show you through scripture, not through Brother Philip's opinion, through scripture, how there were more than 5,000 people there. Huh? John chapter 6 tells us there, right, in verse 4, now the Passover was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a great multitude coming toward him. He said to Philip, no relation, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat this? He said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread 
is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. That's the kind you sit on. So the men, ladies, are you listening? I didn't write this. The men sat down, 5,000. Um, I think it's Matthew, was it Matthew 3.21? I think it's Matthew 3.21. Tells us that they didn't count the women and children. See, in those days, you guys didn't have, ladies, you didn't have the rights that you have today. Now, you're laughing, but that's true. Even today, in the Middle East, women are very limited on their rights in some of those countries. For example, in Saudi Arabia, I'm not making this up, in Saudi Arabia today, 2019, it is illegal for a woman to drive a car. You know, that's not actually such a bad law. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and women can't vote. In those days, women couldn't own businesses, right? All right. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took loaves, gave thanks, distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. Jesus invented all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> so next time you're at Golden Corral, thank the Lord. Amen? And the Bible says in verse 13, they gathered up the leftovers and filled 12 baskets, which were left over and above. Now, why did our Lord want to have a picnic? Why would you want to feed over 5,000? Now, again, 5,000 men were there. The word men there in the Greek refers not just to all men, right? How many men are here? Shut up. It doesn't refer to all of you. It refers to heads of households. You see, in those days, the only person of importance was the head of a household. Dads. How many dads are here? How many dads are with their family? So there's six of us in church. How many dads are here? Raise your hand. Okay, so there's about maybe 100 of us here. So according to the New Testament, if we look at it, extrapolate from that, there's 100 people in church here this morning. But obviously, we have well more than that. So that's why some scholars believe the crowd might have been ten to 15,000. Because they didn't count the women. Lady. Ladies, I'm giving you a shot to say amen. And they didn't count the bambinos. And you know, there's a boatload of people here in church today. Oh, they actually, they're upstairs. I know this building. We used to have church upstairs. Uh, so the classes are upstairs. And there's a gazillion kids up there. You know it and I know it. Because some of you believe in that scripture. Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth. And you're trying to do it all by yourself. And then we have to have adults up there beating, I mean, teaching the kids. So there are more people in church today than what's in the sanctuary. So why? Again, why? Why did our Lord want to feed everybody? Ask me why. why? Come on, ask me why. why? The answer is there in verse 4. The Passover was near. All right? This was probably early Friday afternoon, 2, 3 o'clock, possibly. And our Lord knew that by the time he finished preaching and teaching, by the time everybody got home, the sun would have gone down. The Passover. Ladies, are you still here this morning? Wow. Wow, you really sound excited. Maybe you need to go back to Ontario. Amen. All right. Let's see if I can get you a little more excited. Let's see if I can stir those fire back up. Ladies, during the Passover, you didn't have to do any housework. You didn't have to wash dishes. You didn't have to mop the floor. And you didn't have to slave over a hot stove. Well, don't get too excited. This ain't the Passover. (laughs) 
So our Lord turns to the Apostle Philip and says, where can we buy some bread so everybody can eat? Now, the Apostle comes up with a pretty good answer. It isn't the right answer, but it's a pretty good answer. He says, Lord, if we had about a whole year's salary, we would, if we put everybody's salary together for a whole year, we wouldn't have enough money to buy enough bread so everybody could take a bite. What was the apostle's mistake? Don't answer. That's a rhetorical question. What was the apostle's mistake? Here it is. He failed to consider a supernatural solution. Listen, I don't know what you're going against. I don't know what you're fighting this morning, whether you're fighting some physical challenges, whether you need a miracle in your body, whether you need a financial breakthrough, whether you need a breakthrough in your marriage or with your son or your daughter. I don't know what you're up against this morning, but whatever you're going through this morning, God has a supernatural answer for you. And the Bible says that Jesus asked the apostle this question in order to test him. Because all along, he knew what he was going to do. Isn't that good to know that God always knows what he's doing? You know, sometimes us ministers, we don't know what we're doing. We don't have a clue how it's going to turn out. Pastor, how's it going to turn out? I don't know. But all we know is God has everything under control. Come on, somebody say amen. Huh? But the Bible, the word test there in the King James says prove. That's the King James word. But in the, in the actual Greek translation, here it comes. The word there for test or prove is the word expose. Jesus asked the apostle this question in order to expose him, not embarrass him. Expose. What did our Lord want to expose? He wanted to expose any weakness, any deficiency, any shortcoming in the apostles' faith. My point is simple. God will allow you and I to go through things in order to expose those weaknesses, those shortcomings, those, those deficiencies within our faith. We must be tested before we can be trusted. See, what God is doing here in San Diego, and I'm getting a good handle on it because I was here last week, and I haven't done this in, my God, a long time where I preached back-to-back Sundays. The last time was we were in the multi-purpose building there in La Puente, and Pastor Sonny Sr. asked me to do this. And so kind of looking at this church, I'm getting a good feel for what God is doing here, and sometimes it's hard just to do it on one Sunday. But I can see it clearly now. God is preparing to take victory out of San Diego to the next level. Somebody say amen. Now, in order for this church to go to the next level, our faith must go to the next level. Because it's not a building problem. It's not a money problem. It's not a people problem. It's a faith problem. We fall short in the areas of faith. So here it comes. How does God take my faith to the next level? All right. You've been sick before. Your car's broken down before. You've lost a job before. We've all been through that. Right? And God heals you. God gets you a new car. God opens the door for a new job. Right? Those of us that have been serving the Lord for a while, how does God take our faith to the next level? It's like been there, done that. What he does is, watch this. And some of you are going through this right now. You're going through something right now you've never experienced before. And when that happens, oh, my God, I've never gone through anything like this. I can only share from a personal standpoint. My wife and I, we got married, and we shared this with you last week, 45 years ago. All right. When we got married, we started having kids, right? Bambinos. We had three. Eeny, miny, we in the last one, no more. Right? And when they were small, and those of you that have small kids, it's relatively easy to get them to go to church. However, they don't stay small. We talked a little bit about this last week. They don't stay small. They grow up. Right? Remember I mentioned last week, when they're five, they're full of questions. When they're 15, they're full of answers. When they're 21, they're just full of it. Amen. Amen. 
stay small. They grow up and they turn into teenagers. Some of you have a teenager in your house. If you have a teenage daughter or teenage son, their favorite word, two words are, I know. I know, Mom, I know, I know. You don't got to tell me, Dad. I know. They know everything. <laughs> when they're small, whether you have three kids or five kids, happy meals. <laughs> you roll into McDonald's, you got four kids, I'll have four happy meals to go. So simple, huh? Because they really don't even care about the food. What they want is the what? Very good. When you take your teenager to McDonald's, huh? Okay, uh, can they toast the bread and make sure they cook that burger? I don't want to get no E. coli poisoning. I don't want no onions. I don't like tomatoes. And they got, would you just order? And make no mistake, where the other people laugh? Make no mistake about it. You suckers can eat. Yes, you can. My God, I would tell my son, go ahead, me home, order, order something. Uh, I'll have two Big Macs, quarter pounder with cheese, supersize those fries, uh, chocolate shake and McRib sandwich, and a Diet Coke. <laughs> and here's what gets me. You young people can eat and eat and eat and not gain no weight. <laughs> me, I drive by McDonald's, I gain five pounds. <laughs> oh, but I have a word from the Lord for you young people, and I'll do it in a song. Your day will come. Oh, yes, it will. Faster than you think. You'll be so big, you'll sink. I just made that last part up, amen. And then to get them to serve the Lord, to get your teenagers to come to church. Come on, time to get up. Time for church. Oh, Mom, we're tired. From what? You guys don't work. Oh, we'll go on gang night. We'll go on gang night. We don't want to. It's boring in church this morning. To get them to come to church. And then to get them saved. Because you can't put your teenagers in the home. You feel like putting them in the home. <laughs> All my kids, when they were teenagers... We were, I, I mentioned this last Saturday, remember in our seminar? We, my wife and I were losing them to the world. And listen, I've won dope fiends, uh, gang members, cholos, bikers, lowriders, highriders, truckers, lawyers, liars, well, same thing. Black, white, Chino, Filipino. I won Americans, Dutch, Irish, Brazilian, South Africa. I won them all to the Lord! But I couldn't win my own kids. My wife and I were losing them to the world. Some of you, you're losing your kids to the world. The world is winning. Look at church attendance today. Not in Victoria, San Diego. The body of Christ overall. Every major denomination, this is a fact. This is not my opinion. This is a fact. Every major denomination in our country, including the Roman Catholics, are reporting a decline in church attendance. Yeah. Two movements, and I wouldn't even call them denominations. Two movements are the only ones reporting an increase. The Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses. Why? Well, we know the answer to that. Because they're out there constantly in the streets. Come on, somebody say amen. My wife and I had never gone through anything like that. And, you know, I went before the Lord, and the Lord said, what did you do with those kids after they were born? I said, well, we tried to leave them at the hospital, but they <laughs> made us take them home. I said, we dedicated them. I mean, on Victor, we don't believe in baptizing children, but we believe in dedicating children. Well, that's not just some meaningless ceremony to fill up time on a Sunday morning. God said, you presented those children to me. You have to trust in me. You have to believe in me that I'm going to save your kids. And I mentioned this last week. God said, there are two things I want you to do. I want you to have a good testimony before your family. And number two, pray for them. And that's why my wife and I started doing it every morning. We still do it today. Every morning when we're home, 7 o'clock in the morning, we're turning on the music and we're praying. Now we're praying for our grandkids. Amen. Why? 
Well, we still pray for our kids. But when my wife and I started praying, huh? God started saving our kids. And now all of them are serving the Lord. They're all saved. Amen. Huh? Philip said, Lord, we don't have enough money to buy enough bread. One apostle said, why don't you let them go find food for themselves? Cold-blooded, huh? All right, watch this now. Andrew comes and says, Lord, there's a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. The word barley there, make a note of this. There you go. I see some of you taking notes. I see some of you know. Uh, the word barley there means crithinos. I don't know how to spell it, crithinos, which means fragile bread, bread that breaks. Okay, let's call it crackers. Okay? In those days, that word crithinos was referred to, watch this, as the bread of the poor. Now, those of us that are Chicano or Mexicano, right, we were raised on the bread of the poor. We call them what? Tortillas. If you're black, cornbread. <laughs> bread of the poor, cornbread. If you're white, crackers, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I, I have no idea. <laughs> What's for dinner? Beans and tortillas. Beans and cornbread. Beans and crackers. <laughs> now, what the little boy had, right? He didn't have big old five loaves of bread. He had five little crackers and two small fish. All right. Let me put this in the parlance of Victory Outreach language. Watch this. What the little boy had was his own personal stash. Oh, that you understand, huh? <laughs> now, he could have refused to give it. He could have said, Jesus, because I don't think Jesus ripped him off. Do you think our Lord ripped him off? Give me your lunch, kid. Shut up. Don't tell nobody. No, I think our Lord said, you want to give Jesus your lunch? And if that had been your son or mine, he would have said, no, it's mine. Because kids basically are not generous. We have to teach them. I used to tell my son, share with your sisters. But my grandma gave it to me. I know your grandma gave it to you, but share with your sisters. Because grandmas always give the oldest, but never sometimes give the younger ones. Share with your sisters. But it's mine. Share, but it's mine. It's a, so I take it from him and give it to his sisters. And I tell my son, that's called sharing. He said, No, Dad, that's called stealing. <laughs> the little boy could have held back. Now we know he didn't, but he could have. When it's in the power of your hand to do so. Huh? Release that which you can see. Huh? Now, the little boy could have held back, but he didn't. If, everybody say if. If he would have held back, he would have aborted the miracle before it was born. See, Victory San Diego is pregnant this morning. You are pregnant with a miracle, pregnant with a healing, pregnant with a blessing, pregnant with revival. This church is pregnant with more souls. Oh, my God, it's pregnant. But if we hold back on God, we destroy the miracle before it's born. I'm going to close with this testimony, and it's, it's a true story. It happened years ago, but it still stands up today. And it's a true story, and I'm going to, I'm going to, you can go ahead and run a make on me if you want. Go on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, Twitter or whatever it's called, Instagram, and check, check it out for yourself. My wife and I had our son, Philip Jr. He was a baby. Our two daughters hadn't been born. And we had no food in the house. We've all gone through that. I mean, the, the cockroaches got up and moved out. <laughs> the flies felt sorry for us, chipped in and took up a love offering to fix the screen door. <laughs> My wife said, there's nothing to eat. I said, I know we're fasting. <laughs> she said, what about the baby? I said, give him, give him water with sugar or something. <laughs> He's on his last bottle of milk. I said, well, uh, put water in it. Water it down. Step on it. Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, he's wearing his last pamper. Get a trapo, get a towel. She goes, you mean to tell me you ain't got any money? I go, I got $10. Now, we all know $10 is not a lot of money. But when it's all you got, 
And again, it's hard to release it when it's set aside for something else. When it's your cell phone payment, your car payment, your house payment. It's hard to release those, huh? This is money. Oh, my God. Right? This is my money for my new shoes. Right? Oh, it's hard to give it up, huh, girl? Yeah, it is. Because all you see are those shoes. And so I said, well, I have to. We, we, were, we, were, we were on St. Louis Street in those days. And we were planning a, a rally at East LA College. And I, I, I said, well, this is gas money, but I'll go by faith to the East LA Church. We were on St. Louis Street. I said, uh, after the meeting, if I don't run out of gas, uh, I'll stop at the market, buy the bread, the milk, which you can get 99 cent bread, milk that's almost turning green or whatever. What costs the most is the Pampers. That's right. She says, okay. Don't go to Pizza Hut or Burrito Money. Don't go in and out. I said, okay, no, no, I want it. Don't worry. So I'm there. I got up and I spoke on evangelism. That's what that's what he told me. He said, you speak on evangelism, and I'm going to get up and take up an offering for flyers and posters. So I'm sitting in the back, behaving myself, just wait for him to dismiss and then go home. He gets up and says, we're going to take an offering. Because that's how he talks. And I'm sitting there, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, I want you to give that $10. <laughs> how many know we're good at making excuses? Yes, you are. But God, how many know, but God, this isn't for me. It's for the baby. God said, I know, but God said, release that which you can see. And I'll release that which you cannot. So I took the $10, and again, $10 is not a lot, but hey, when it's all you got, the bucket came by, and I released it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, come on. <laughs> again, visit a black church. Amen. You'll see real Holy Ghost people. Amen. Uh, so the offering went in, and I had it all figured out how God was going to bless me. I was going to get a Pentecostal handshake. So I made sure I shook everybody's hand. I waited for everybody to leave. The only one that was left was Pastor Sonny. I thought, oh, shoot, he ain't going to give me nothing. And you can tell him I said so. Amen. Because back then we were pioneering, not like today. So I said, well, shoot, I'm in trouble. So I go in the office. My wife stayed home with the baby. I call her. And she answered. <laughs> Women are like ducks. Yes, you are. Close your mouth. I'm not your dentist. Put that eyebrow down. Yes, you are. Women are like ducks. Because I told my wife, guess what? Why? 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 Guess what? I guess you could discern my now. You'll never see me speaking at a women's convention, huh? <laughs> Sister Julie's already banned me, amen? But the men are just as bad, only we're more like owls. Hey, guess who's getting married? Who? 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 What's who? So I told my wife, I go, you know what? You know that $10 I had? Uh-huh. Well, the Lord. Yeah. El Señor. I ain't went black, the Lord. I said, the Lord, you know, sister's souls are dying. It's still late for you. She goes, I know. I said, well, Pastor Sonny took up an offering, and, and, and I gave that $10, and I thought I was going to get a Pentecostal handshake, but I didn't get blessed, and I didn't get no Pentecostal handshake, and I didn't get blessed. She goes, oh, yes, we have. That's what I'm trying to tell you. If you would just shut up and let me talk. Now, some of you think I'm making this up. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> Two sisters from our church. In those days, they were Dolly and Dora. Dolly and Dora. What was her last name? No. You don't even remember, Tony. You don't even know where you're at this morning, huh? <laughs> Wake him up. Um. Dolly and Dora, Reyes, 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 Dolly and Dora Reyes. Dolly's older sister, Dora's younger. They're still in the mother church today. 
Dolly married Pastor Hal. Dora married Hector Mayorga. They're in our church. Run and make them. I'm giving names. Write them down. <laughs> they were single on their way to the meeting. God spoke to Dolly. She turns to the door and says, Philip and Cindy are on my heart. Pull into a market. And my wife's telling me this on the phone. Guess what they bought us? They bought us bags full of groceries, milk, butter, cheese, bread, chicken, apple, soda, ice cream. I said, praise the Lord. The fast is over. We eat tonight. She goes, guess what? She goes, they even, they even bought a box of Pampers. I said, praise the Lord. God even knows your most specific need. Here's how I know God has a sense of humor. She goes, guess what, Daddy? They gave me a Pentecostal handshake. They gave me some money. I give the offering, and you give the money to her. You don't play fair. <laughs> so they gave me some money. Here's how you, pay attention. Here's how you stay married 45 years. I said, no, 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 no. They didn't give me, they gave we. <laughs> What's yours is mine and mine is yours. Honey, we're in this together. I said, Daddy's coming home, and I put the phone down, and the power of God came upon me, and I began to shake, and I began to cry, and God spoke to my heart. He said, you see, my son, if I taught you to run, you're not going to tumble. If I taught you to fly, you're not going to fall. If I taught you to swim, you're not going to drown, for I am Jehovah Jireh. I am the God that will provide for you. I can open up the windows of heaven and pour out my blessing. Oh, hallelujah. God said, don't you think if I can save you, if I can deliver you from drugs, surely I'll meet your every need. For I am faithful to my word. I am faithful to my promises. I am El Shaddai. I am more than enough. I am the mighty one of Israel. There is nothing too hard from the Lord. This morning, I want to pray for your faith. Because it all comes down to faith. Huh? Now unto him who wants to bless us exceedingly abundantly. Above all that we ask or think. According to the power of faith. Activated within our lives. It's not a money problem. Some of you ladies. Now I understand some women had to work and couldn't get off work. I understand that part. You know, you have to, you have to put in so many years in a company. Only get vacation time. That part I understand. Right? I didn't know that before. But some of you could have went. But you didn't go, I didn't have the money. No, you didn't have the faith. You didn't have the faith. Many of these ladies, they couldn't afford to go. But they couldn't afford not to go. But they said, God, I'm going to believe you for the money. I'm going to believe you for the miracle. Guys, some of you, you're not even planning on going to Mighty Man of Valor. And it's not because you don't love God, you're not saved. It's because your faith. It's not a lack of finances. It's a lack of faith. I'm going to open up the altar. And God is saying, listen, surely I will meet your need. Hallelujah. The altars are open. You come. Let's go, guys. Come on. Oh.